All right, we're up and running. Hope everyone's doing well. So I think PA5 is finally finished. The last submissions have been turned in. Um, and so let me let me talk just a little bit about um, about PA5. Let me show you some sample code from that. Uh, let's see. Go ahead and shoot me an attendance ping. And so again, most people most people got PA5 to work in the end, so not a lot of surprises here, but but just to kind of close the loop. Um, let me let me run through some sample code. Um, so this was this was my version of PA5. Um, make sure your shebang is in the beginning of your script. Some people, you know, went in and added comments at the end of the assignment, and they put their comment block with their name and stuff in the very beginning of the file, and then the shebang was down here. It's not a shebang if it's not the very first line of the file. So if someone on a different shell tried to run your script, it wouldn't work. So make sure this is this is always the first line of the file, is the bin bash. Um, so yeah, you know, at least have your name, date, name of the assignment, um, and some sort of synopsis. This is probably a minimum synopsis that you'd want to have. Um, and you would, you know, if you were doing this on the job or something, you would have much more detail in here. You would say exactly what it means to cleanse the input, what special characters are removed and so on and so forth but you know this is this is the intro to the program it's like what you would put in a readme but it's it's actually in the script um, so there's my associative array I called it count so declare that up front don't declare it inside the loop um, just do it in the very beginning and then all of this is just one big long loop that basically reads lines processes them um, and it loops from there to there so while read line do, so if we're inside the loop, line is the next line of input, everything up through the new line. Um, and then this is just a big, long, horrific combination of sed and tr to, um, to cleanse and, and clean up the line. So echo the line. This is important. If you don't have that, then you're not processing the line at all. You're just reading standard in. So echo the line, translate it to uppercase. Change the characters we want to get rid of to an at sign. Change the single quote to an at sign. Um, and then get rid of all of the at signs. So we've gotten rid of all special characters. Change um, spaces and tabs into underscores. And then change multiple underscores into a single underscore. So that, that conditions the, um, the input so that spaces look like underscores. Um, and then look for separators. So echo your line, and if you have any of these separator characters, change them into a space. So now phrases is that single line of input you read with a bunch of phrases on it. Inside each phrase, the spaces are underscores, and between the phrases you find a single space. Um, and then we can iterate over the phrases with a for in loop. So for phrase and phrases do, so each time we go through this loop, phrase will be a single phrase with underscores instead of spaces. So get rid of the leading and trailing underscores, which people discovered. Um, and then um, and the, the star says zero or more repetitions of the previous symbol. So this is zero or more underscores anchored at the beginning. This is zero or more underscores anchored at the end. And then if the resulting phrase is empty, we don't want to do anything with it, so we just say continue. Um, otherwise, get the current count from our tally. So the whole point of our associative array is if you index it with a phrase, it will tell you how many times you've seen that phrase. If you've never seen the phrase and you try to index with the phrase, you'll get you know an empty line out. So I set C equal to the current number of times we've seen the phrase. I increment it, and then I save that back in. Um, and it, several students tried to do this in one statement, and you can do that if you're careful, but, 
but a lot of students were doing this with some different version of this where they were skipping the curly brackets and that was that was throwing errors in some cases where a phrase had um, dollar signs inside for example so you know do what works and then you can you can try to make it you know fancier or shorter or faster or something later on but but for for these classes definitely do what works and do what makes sense um, so just read out you know use this as an index read the element indexed by that that's our current count increment account this is how we increment things in bash and then save that back into the array so at the end of this loop what have we done we've tallied all of the phrases in the current input line sorry this loop right down here we've tallied all the phrases in the current input line and then this done goes with this while and so at the end of this we've tallied all of the phrases in all of the input lines and so we're done we've we've processed the entire file and so now the only thing left is to output the results and so we we do one more for in and so this is how we access the keys or the phrases and for each one um, get rid of the underscores change them back into spaces and then just echo the count which we read from the array followed by the phrase that we've cleaned up and that gives you your final output so that's that's one approach to it um, and like I say, there's there's other ways people did this that are that are just as good. Um, so takeaways: make sure you understand associative arrays because those will be on the exam. Make sure you understand this this read loop business. Um, know how to use sed and tr. Um, make sure you know how to pipe commands. So some people did each of these and put the output into a file and then read the file. Did another command put the output in another file and so on that's exactly the same thing as what pipe does right so so um, piping is is a way to do that without having to use temporary files but it basically says take the output of this command use that as the input of this and then whatever output this generates use that as the input of this so definitely understand that know how to use the for in loop um, and I think those are the main takeaways. I have a slight question that's probably tangential. Okay. Do you know how well your code performs with text four? It's a little pokey. <laughs> um. You, I know, because it looks like with all those echoes with a loop like that, I feel like it would take more than minutes so the, the thing is and I saw some people talking about this right my echoes don't happen until the very end here this is not where you see the slowdown on test 4 test 4 when it's slow it's usually sitting there and it's not producing any output until the end and and yes echoing takes longer than than processing inside the CPU but it's all the stuff up here that takes most of the time I think I'm also talking about the echoes in the fact that you're echoing uh, the... Oh, inside uh, here? Yeah, because when I removed that segment from my code, I got, like, instant, like, boost in performance. If you remove this in the very first one, though, what you're really doing is you're telling TR to read all of standard in up to the end of the file. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, in the sense of, like, uh, avoiding it, since instead of, like, always echoing, you then just save your, your big chunk to a file, and then give TR the file instead. Yeah. Because that's one, that was my workaround with, to try and get it from, because my, my task was like nine minutes, and man, it, it hurt me whenever I run it, because the fact that I just like, why isn't it doing anything? Right, right. It's just sitting there, it, it, why, is, why is there no output? Mm -hmm. And I, I no. think what you're seeing, I could be wrong, I think what you're seeing is the effect of, of doing this in a loop. And doing all of this business on every single line, one line at a time, as opposed to just doing it on the whole file. And if I, if I, you know, have multiple TR commands and multiple sed commands, each of these is a process yeah. that has to get started and run. 
didn't really find much of a performance hit with the processing part of like the breaking it into chunks and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, running it through PR instead, like the the worst I got, I th- actually I think even I didn't even touch that. I never even improved that. So it I using with like I can't. Uh, I think I did a full file. I didn't do it line by line, but uh, with the or. How do you tell your isn't isn't your tallying in the loop though? Um Yeah, so oh. that I think is unavoidable. You have to go through and, and grab yeah. each phrase to tally it. Yeah, like because when I tallied my phrases, um to save time, just the because I I just could not handle running test four because of how slow it was. Mm-hmm. I would I went the echo phrase into like a thing that like like uh I guess. Into anything, I would I would feed whatever I wanted the file. I I mean I in I I just kind of like okay right before I go into a loop, pu- like pump the process uh, book into a file. Right. And feed that instead, and that was where I got a lot of, a lot of improvements. Just yeah, that that just piping echo t- takes like for small files it's like nothing at all, but when you this nothing at all with infinite time becomes something significant. Right, right, and yeah, I think it's because if you do, if you break this into phrases like this, then you're you're doing this stuff, you know, multiple times, as opposed to just doing it once. If you put all the phrases in a file and just just said that file once, um, I, I actually sent it this file the same time. I think it was a case where get, handing it a whole file right. was faster than Echo because I think Echo. Is slow. Yeah, I don't think echo is the problem. I think I think if you echoed the whole file and put it into set, I think you'd find it was just as fast. I think the issue with this is that we're we're iterating on the, the we're iterating across the phrases. Yeah, because like in I don't know, cause I, I saw actual improvement when I would uh, when I did like the like uh, less than. Yeah, less than symbols with like a file that's mm-hmm. what I made. Yeah. And uh, I, I versus uh, echoing in the whole loop. Cause I broke mine I, in like the four different parts, and only the I think the input, uh, uh, tally and output. Mm-hmm. Uh, text processing didn't didn't have a loop. Um, all of them had loops, and the where I got the most improvement was that in the loop for uh, tally. Um, I didn't do echo into echo pipe. Mm-hmm. I did like in I think I I think I, what I did is I didn't do that stuff. I did an awk mm-hmm. where where I echoed uh, my phrases into awk and the print one. To, uh, no, I didn't do a print. One. I did a print. I did the uh, I passed awk into a variable and had that print and then used that as the phrase and some other stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that makes I sense. It was infinitely faster when and when I didn't echo uh, pipe into awk. It, instead, I would less than the a file into there. Yeah, I, yeah. It, I, only, I only really saw, like, it was just clear improvement just for test four. Mm-hmm. Like, test four took nine minutes, and I, I, nine minutes without, like, output. Right. It's just more, it's beyond nerve wreck. It, it's like, it's like the worst kind of like jack in the box, you know. Yeah, um, and and sometimes what you can do is you can throw in some some print statements in your loop to like you know print out a dot every hundred lines that are processed or something like that, and that's that's where progress bars come from, right? Where where something's going to take a long time and you want to reassure the user we're doing something, so so you know you could put a counter in and every hundred counts put a, put out a symbol. And uh, give the user something to do, or put out a yeah. pipe and then backspace it with a slash, and then backspace it with a dash, and then backspace it with a backslash, and get a little twirling line like that. Um, so yeah, there's there's stuff you can do. But yeah, I, I saw I saw a few versions of this that work really really fast on on test four, which um, which was cool. Most of them um, took you know. At least a minute or two. Some of them took ten minutes on test four, but like I say, I just opened multiple windows and test in parallel. 
Yeah. So your would you say that yours was closer to like uh, like a two minute uh, test score or like a ten minute? Oh, test? I don't know. Um, I think it was about a minute. Um, so somebody asked in chat, um, can you do count bracket quote dollar sign phrase plus one instead of assigning it to a variable? You can, but you got to make sure that you're reading this correctly. So dollar sign curly bracket count bracket quote dollar sign phrase bracket curly bracket plus one. Um, and put that inside dollar sign paren paren and if there's a typo in there you know good luck ferreting that out so that's the main reason that I, I broke it into pieces um, but yeah you can you can do that in one line also So awk is is a really good tool that um, you know is very efficient and is not um, is probably not doing associative arrays the same way that that bash is certainly the way that we write um, bash. So all right, so test four is doing its thing. So yeah, I'm guessing about a minute, one to two minutes. So now I gotta wait for all my output, and that's always gonna be slow. Um, should have redirected. But yeah, that was probably one to two minutes. So any other questions, comments on PA5 or associative arrays, things like that? Way too easy. Way too easy, awesome. I yeah. want to see. That was a minute 54 with, with output time. Um, we will get to do a version of this in C in 2.22. Um, and it will be one of the more challenging assignments because you're going to have to create a number of data structures, including hashes and linked lists. Um, and so that'll, that'll be fun. That'll be a good, uh, good assignment. But we'll have to do some other assignments first to... Uh, to lead up to that and learn some of the data structure concepts. All right. Well, let's um let's continue looking at processes and let's talk about signals. So um, I mentioned yesterday that when you run a process and you hit Control-C, Control-C doesn't actually say, you know, kill the process. What Control-C does, and you see this sometimes for Control-C, what this does is it sends what's called a signal. So we have, we have all these different processes running on the system. We can see these by saying top or ps-elf or whatever. We have all these different processes, and it's possible for one process to send a message to another process. And these messages are very short. They're what are called signals. And it's basically just kind of a, a tap on the shoulder, right? Which says, hey, and depending, you've, you've got, you know, a couple of dozen signals you can send. And depending on the signal and how the process that gets the signal is set up, it can respond to that tap in a variety of ways. It could completely ignore it, or it could use it to say, you know, I want to do something like exit, or it could use it to say, hey, somebody has information for me. Let me go, you know, to a file or a pipe or something and read additional information. And so it's it's kind of, you know, the, the opening nudge in what could be a longer communication. Um, And so we can play with these in Bash. 
But in general, the way that we kill, that we signal a process is with the kill command. So let's um, let's just put a sleep command out here. Um, if I say kill, um, and I can do percent one to indicate this process, it comes back and it says, "Hey, process one was terminated." If I say trap dash L, I see a variety of signals I can use though. So these are our numeric signal values followed by a human readable name. So signal one is called sig hup. Hup is short for hang up. This is like hanging up the phone when you make a dial up connection to a computer. Two is sig int. That's an interrupt. That's what control C generates. Three is sig quit, which might be an end of file. I'm not sure. Um, sig ill, I don't remember. Sig trap. There's some user signals. User 1 and user 2 can be specified by the user for whatever purpose you want. Here's a sig bus. This is used when there's some sort of bus error, some sort of, of issue in communicating between different systems. Here's a sig FPE. That's a floating point exception. If you have floating point numbers and you try to divide 1 by 0 or maybe take a negative square root, you might generate a floating point exception. Here's a kill. This says die, die, die. That like tells the process to go away right now. And so, so there's all these different signals that are used for different things. And we can have alarms and, and we can have signals from children and, um, and so on. And so if I do my sleep 1000, and I say kill dash two percent one. The dash two says I want to send a signal sig int to process percent one, which is this process that's sleeping. And so now it says interrupt, right? Because I sent it a sig int, a sig interrupt. If I do sleep one thousand and I hit control C. It does the same thing. It interrupts the process and it causes that sleep process to go away. If I do a kill, I don't know, dash H, percent one, that's an FPE error. It says floating point exception. So there, there was no floating point going on, right? Sleep does not do any arithmetic, other than counting maybe. Um, but it received a signal saying, hey, there's been a floating point exception. And when it does that, you know, we get a message back saying, hey, floating point exception. If I do a kill dash seven, I get a bus error. So this is something like a seg fault. So these, these actually, let me do this. Um, all right, so there's a segmentation fault on the sleep command. So, so we, we normally live in a, a Unix world where, you know, we get these messages, floating point exception, segmentation fault, and they mean something. But, but they're really the result of something sending a signal to a process. So if you're running a piece of C code and it tries to access a memory location that doesn't exist, like you forgot to initialize a pointer, or you passed you know, a variable instead of ampersand variable to a scan, when the CPU tries to read a location in memory that doesn't exist, the memory subsystem creates what's called an exception and that tells the operating system, hey, you should send a signal to this process. Send it a signal 11 because we had some kind of, of um, segmentation violation, a seg v. And when the process receives that signal 11, it will exit and the message you get will be segmentation fault. But these signals themselves, I mean, have nothing to do with, with, you know, doing arithmetic or accessing memory or anything like that. It's just a signal, right? If you tap 
process on the shoulder and say, hey, signal 11, and it's wired so that when it sees that, it says seg fault, and it exits. This core dump used to be a thing. It used to be that when a program exited like this, it would take the contents of main memory and write it into a file. And then you could go in with GDB and look at that file and see exactly what was going on. It doesn't actually dump core anymore, but you used to end up with a file called core in your current directory. And it was a copy of the entire memory. All right, so, um, so we can um, do our own thing with these signals by using a trap command. And so in bash, we can say, I want to trap a certain signal. Instead of when I get a sig int, just exiting my, my script, I want to do something different. And so, so here's a sample program called sleeper. And I have a statement, trap pwd2. What this means is, hey, I want to be alerted when I receive signal 2. That's the sig int. And when I get a sig2, I want to say, print my current directory. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sleep 20 seconds. I'm going to say sleeping some more, and I'm going to sleep another 5 seconds, and I'm going to say bye. All right. So if I just run this without doing anything funny... If I just run this, it'll hang out for 20 seconds, and then it'll say sleeping some more, and, and hang out for another 5 seconds, and then be done. So it's executing this statement right now, which just sort of like hangs out in the background. And then it finished, it did this echo, it's sleeping 5 seconds now, and then it'll echo by. So let me run this in the background, and let me say kill-2% 1, and all of a sudden, my script prints out the current working directory. And that kill signal interrupted this sleep command, but it didn't terminate the process. So the sleep command got terminated, but this script said, hey, when you get a sig int, just go ahead and print your current directory. And then it went ahead and it slept five more, and then it said goodbye. And so if I run this, and I hit Control-C, same thing happens. Instead of terminating my script, Control-C prints out my current directory, and then it can, continues my script, which, um, which sleeps another five seconds. So we can make a sleeper2 script, which does the following. It's setting up a trap for sigint, and when it receives a sigint, it's going to echo ha ha ha. And my main script is just an infinite loop, which says echo hello and sleep one second. So I can run sleeper2. I can't spell it, but I can run it, and it just prints out hello every second. And if I hit control C, it just laughs at me and it keeps running. And no matter how fast I am, I can't control C out of this. Because I basically changed how this process responds to a sig int. So is a trap command considered like, um, I was gonna say, it's like a, well, I see it gives you a message if you do some sort of action. Um, but I'm still kind of wondering what would happen if you were to change the last number uh, in that trap statement. So this 2 is saying I want you to trap signal 2, which is a sig int. If I changed it to an 8, it would trap whatever signal 8 is. Um, well, I execute it, right? Yeah, so... so. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, so 8 would respond to a floating point exception. And I can list multiple signals here, or I could make multiple trap statements. 
So if I had a script that might potentially, um, you know, generate a floating point exception, I could say, hey, if you get a floating point exception, don't exit. Call this function instead, or run some other script, or echo something. So this can be any any bash statement I want, and this can be any signal or list of signals. So I'm trapping my sig int, and I can't I can't kill this process, but I can control Z it to um, to suspend it, and I can kill it with a percent nine, and percent nine will always kill. Right, so this this uh, sig kill is un untrappable, and I think it's the only signal that you can't trap. But that's good to have one like that because then you can always like make your processes go away. And a lot of these signals, if you don't manage them, they will they will um, cause your process to go away anyway. So if I kill with like a, I don't know what sig continue is, but let's kill it with a. The sig continue doesn't do anything. If I send it a signal 19, it stops. Well, that's a sig stop signal. Right? That's like hitting a control Z. I'm guessing sig urgent will, t will kill it. Nope. But nine will always kill it. So you can you can use this, you know, to handle unexpected conditions. You can also use it to make really annoying software that a user can't get out of um, unless they control Z it and so on. So, um, but it's it's a useful feature, um, and it's just part of Bash. All right, uh, chat question. What's the C library command that returns memory to the system after a function or process is done with it? That would be the free function. Um, so malloc is used to allocate memory. Free is used to deallocate or release it. And yeah, you can definitely make prank programs using trap, which may be why I didn't mention it till after PA5. All right, so that's a little bit of, of um, working with processes from Bash. Let's go, um, let's go under the hood and look at processes and see. And the main function I want to talk about is called fork. And fork, it's in manual chapter two, which means it's kind of a low-level system uh, function. And fork creates a new process by duplicating the calling process. The new process is referred to as a child. The calling process is referred to as the parent. And so this this takes some some getting used to. So imagine you have a C program running, and there's some process. And at some point, you say, let's make a call to fork. Your current process continues running when this returns, but at that point, a second process has been created, and it's an almost exact duplicate of the original process. And this is the way that processes are created. It's by cloning. So when you want to make a new process, the first step is to clone your current process. That brings a new process into existence. And then if you want that new process to do something other than what you're already doing, you do something to basically transform this into a new process. 
or a, a process which is doing something new, this will be something called exec. But we'll talk about that probably tomorrow. So this fork is a really interesting function. Um, and so we include unistandard.h, that's where fork is prototyped. Um, and I said it's almost an exact duplicate. There's one difference. So fork returns an int. It, it actually returns a PID underscore T, but it's basically an int. And the return value from fork is different depending on whether you're the parent or the child. Other than that, these two processes are identical. So let's let's mess around with this. simple test program here so um, I'm gonna print out a message ready to go I'm going to call the fork function and then I'm going to print out a message all done that's all we're doing here all right you ready for magic check that out So it printed ready to go once, it printed all done twice. Why did it print all done twice? Because as soon as I made this call to fork, the current process got cloned. And now there were two processes that had just finished this call to fork and each of those printed out all done. So one goes in, two comes out. Now we can see a little better what's going on if we print out the value of this variable p that came back from the call to fork. So when we print out all done, let's print out what p is equal to. And one of the processes said all done p equals 6238, the other said all done p equals zero. So the two processes that result after we call fork are almost identical. There's one difference and one difference only. And so if we go down to return value, um, on success, the PID of the child process is returned to the parent. Zero is returned to the child. So if this fork call returns a zero, you are the child, you're the clone. If it returns something non-zero, you're the parent. And the thing it returned is the process ID of the child. So we can do something like this. So we can look at the return value from fork. If it's zero, then we can announce I'm the child process. If it's not zero, then we can announce I'm the parent and the child's ID is whatever that value of P is, that non-zero value of P. So the parent said my child's ID is 6276. The child knows that it's the child process. And each time we run this, we will get a different ID for the child.
And if I do this quickly, you notice my process ID is going up by twos. Why? Because when I run main, that's a process. When I create a child, that's a second process. And these IDs are mostly sequential, but you know, there's other stuff that kicks in. But, but, you know, it was 15, so the next time I said main, that was 16, and the child was 17. All right, so let's make this more interesting. Let's sleep inside each of these processes. And sleep is a bash command, right? We can find it in chapter one of the manual pages. But it's also a callable function, and we can find it in manual three. So inside Unistandard, we can find documentation for sleep. It takes an unsigned integer number of seconds. So we're going to do the same thing now, but each process is going to go to sleep after it prints out its identity. So let me run this in the background. So uh, the parent said my child's ID is 6448, and the child said I'm the child process. And I ran it in the background with the ampersand, so I, I've got control of bash. So let's do a ps-l, and we can see two copies of the main program. Thank you. So I said main, but now there's two mains running. One of these has a parent ID of 6144. 6144, that's my bash process. So this is the main program that was started by bash when I said main. The second main program has a parent ID of 6447, guess what? That's the process ID of main. That's the process that was created by main. And its process ID is 6448, which is what the child um, ID was, which the parent discovered. So we've got two processes out there right now, and they're both just kind of hanging out. And they'll sleep for a thousand seconds and go away. But of course I can kill them. One way to kill them is to just foreground the main program and control C. And now both of those are gone. So that's the fork command. So let me show you something that, that is really easy to do and you really don't want to do this unless you're on your own machine. But it's a natural thing to be curious about and um, if you try this on the server it'll probably not work but don't try it anyway. But if you want to try this on your own machine or on a virtual box or something like that, that's totally that's totally your deal. Let's call fork three times. And we get a whole bunch of output generated. And if I do a PS, I have multiple copies of main running. I have eight copies of main running. And this is, this is, you know, exponential growth, geometric growth. So the first time I call fork, I get a pair of processes. And each of these processes thinks that it just came back from this line of code. And so each of those processes is about to execute this statement. And so when this first process executes fork, it creates a clone. And when the second process executes fork, it creates a clone. 
and now I've got four processes, each of which thinks it just came back from this highlighted statement and is now about to do this statement. And so each of those processes makes a call to fork, and that creates a clone. So every time I call fork, I double the number of processes I have. Because each of those newly created processes is also calling fork. Why is that? Because when I call fork, I get an exact copy of my current process, other than this return value. So if I made 10 calls to fork, I would probably crash my system. Certainly if I put this in a while loop, I would, I would run out of memory, I'd run out of process slots and my system would crash. Now, uh, I think if you do this on the server, I've got a process limit set up, but I made it pretty generous because um, some people are running Tmux and such. So, um, so don't do this on somebody else's machine, but if you want to play around on your own, um, this is how you make a fork bomb, right? And it's, it's you know, really simple. Um, Right, that's all you need. Uh, so you don't have to assign fork to a variable. Like like most functions, you can call it even if it returns an integer. You're free to ignore it. Um, but then you've got two two versions of your process, and no way to know which was which. And if you don't need to know which was which, they can just both go off and do the same thing. So don't do this. And most systems will have a limit on how many processes one user can create and you would run out of process slots, but also probably generate log messages that an administrator would be unhappy about. Um, but that's, that's, you know, how simple it is to flood the process space. Uh, let's see, I've been trying to find fork in my C book and it doesn't exist. Um, so this is interesting, right? Fork is is not part of the C language, right? It's it's in um, you know any Unix distribution you find is going to include fork because that's how you create processes. Um, but it's not necessarily something that a C book would talk about because it's not really a language component. It's more about the operating system, um, and so I have things. A yeah, go ahead. Um, it, it seems obvious to me that some of these programs we're talking about in this class might just be like C executables. Uh, what does but that mean? I, I don't know. I I don't know any specific examples, but like. Would set or awk or some of these bash commands could they potentially just be like C executables? That's exactly what they are. Oh, okay. So sed, for example, is a C program, and you can find the source code for it and look at it and compile it or change it and so on, and it's it's just an executable. Um, and most of what we do in Linux is we run compiled C programs: sed, awk, GCC. Um, cat, date, all of these things, they're almost completely written in C and, um, you know, pre-compiled for us and they're sitting usually under, you know, slash bin or maybe slash USR slash bin. Um, same with dialogue and, you know, everything that we've been doing, um, yeah, those are all just, just C programs. Um, so fork is not necessarily a bash thing. It's it's really a call that you make um, from something like a C program, right? It's it's part of the runtime library. It's a function like printf or scanf that we can call. Um, but you could make a script, maybe, or an executable program that clones your current process. Um, I don't think there's one of those right now. But every time you run something in Bash, you create a new process. 
And so, you know, another version of a fork bomb is, you know, if you have a script named main, just have it execute main, one line script, and that'll use up your process spaces because each time you do this, you get a copy of your current process and that starts executing um, that program. So processes and process analysis are, are sometimes strange things to think about. Um, and we'll dig further into them tomorrow. Um, we don't usually, at a first cut, deal with fork and this, this later thing called exec. Um, there's better ways, if you just want a, process, a program to run a command, um, we can use a call named system. And we'll talk about system tomorrow, but if you man page it, it's from chapter three, which means it's a higher level um, library function. And it uses fork and it uses execl, um, but it, it lets us basically just run a command from a C program. So we'll start with that tomorrow. We'll, we'll look at how to use system and then we'll move on to, um, to P open and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about fork and exec if we have time. Um, and this is, this is all, you know, high level, broad brushstroke kind of, of uh, discussion. We're not getting into a lot of the nitty gritty. You'll do that um, in other courses down the road, but just kind of like looking at um, what processes are and how they, they are managed in C um, and Unix. All right, uh, something attendance ping on the way out. Have a great afternoon. I will see you all tomorrow. Thanks, you too. See you, See you then.